Okay, I'm going to call the uh, June 20th, 2024 meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Dan? Here. Gordon? Here. Kennedy? Here. McKelvey? Thompson? Bohemus? Here. And then next would be statements of disqualification. Do we have any statements of disqualification this evening? Seeing none, we will move to oral communications. Uh, for those in the audience that wish to speak, oral communications is for items tonight that are not on our agenda and anybody that wants to address the commission on anything unrelated to tonight's agenda. Do we have anybody that would like to speak in oral communications? Please come forward. Uh, you, you can, yes. Hi, I need to ask you a question. It's occurring to me that I might have a conflict on the Pacific Cultural Center building that I'm within the... Um, I'm sorry, could you hold your sorry. comments really quick? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, there's a certain radius where you have a conflict of interest. So. It did not that. occur to me until just now. Sorry. It's okay. It's, uh, yeah, 1307 and 1311 is the other one? 13? So then no Sorry. statements of disqualification? No. Okay. Oral communications. Hello, ma'am. Uh, you have two minutes. Thank you for your time here and all the time you spend trying to keep our community in some type of recognizable shape and form, maybe. Um, my name is Anina Van Alstein, and I'm a real estate broker in Santa Cruz. I've lived here since 1971. My father was a city planner. Uh, we spent a lot of time in Europe where he studied how you make viable towns. And one of the most important things about a viable town is public transportation that does not require cars or buses. And I have been struggling trying to write a piece for the Sentinel that would be longer than 175 words about my complete dismay at how we have, the, the city council and the planning department, frankly, have thrown Santa Cruz to the dogs. I feel like we need the courage to sue the state and get some relief from the pressures of SB9, which does not acknowledge our geographic location in regards to how people get to and from work, most of the people who can afford housing in Santa Cruz commute over the hill. That is a big oversight in the way that the downtown development is being planned. There is way There are way too many bedrooms that are gonna need way too many cars and way too many people that are gonna need to travel the hill to afford them. The second part of why I'm struggling with this is that there is no such thing as affordable construction. Basic construction now is over $600 a square foot, and that's not including special improvements for living in a liquefaction zone. So buildings are being built with the premise that somehow the state has this desperation to create affordable housing, and yet the housing that's being built will not be affordable, and the people who could afford to pay the astronomical rents aren't gonna be able to get back and forth over the hill to come here, and we're gonna kill the tourism uh, attractiveness of our town because frankly if you can't even walk down the street it's going to be a problem so I hope I'm really pleading that you guys that the people will have the courage we need to to get someone to say to the state stop we just keep seeing these incredibly unwell planned developments being approved right and left and yes I'm talking about the town clock situation I'm talking about everything it's, it's once these buildings are built and there are no roads, we're gonna really be stuck forever. It's gonna choke our town. Please reconsider just throwing in the towel on our town. 
It's my town. I've lived here a long time, and I wish you would fight for it instead of just giving in to SB9. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else that would like to speak for oral communications? Seeing none, uh, we will move on to approval of the minutes. We have one set of minutes from May 16th, 2024. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Could you please call the roll call vote? Commissioner Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. McKelvey? Thompson? Oh, I miss. Yes. Okay, so ordered. Uh, item number two is a presentation on health and all policy, sustainability, and resiliency update. Um, do we have a presentation from staff? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, uh, Commissioners and Chairperson. I'm Tiffany Wisewas, the Sustainability and Resiliency Officer here at the City. I'm here to give you an update on health and all policies, which is our equity initiative, sustainability and resiliency here at the city. The city manager has asked me to visit key commissions and committees with this information, as there has been quite a bit of turnover since I have last done so. And we saw in the recent survey, which many of you I'm sure uh, took uh, on demographics, that there were questions about these topics. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity to update you all. So I will um, talk about the various work plans and background around each of these topics. And then lastly, um, I'll talk about a change management initiative that we are embarking upon to more deeply integrate and more holistically integrate these topics into the city as an organization. Just to um, kind of share with you, where does this work live? I'm going to be presenting you citywide work, um, but really I do, uh, the Climate Action Program is kind of the focal hub um, for all things climate and equity. Um, we have about two and a half FTE in uh, our program, and we work uh, quite closely with all the departments, as well as our internal sustainability team and our external community climate action task force, which is made up of 10 members of the community appointed by the mayor. However, that format's changing, and I'll talk to talk about that in a moment. I also want to emphasize the importance of regional collaboration. Um, we helped, or we uh, co-founded the Monterey Bay Regional Climate Project Working Group um, that was stood up last year. Uh, the sole purpose of that group, it's San Benito, Monterey, Santa Cruz counties, Watsonville, and City of Santa Cruz. Sole purpose of that group is to bring in transformative scale climate investment for our region, acknowledging that if we go together, it's more powerful than little Santa Cruz going alone for this big federal funding. We wrote 32 million in grant proposals in 2023 alone with much of that pending right now. Um, we also, just kind of going up the scales, we hold leadership roles in the Central Coast Climate Collaborative and the Green Cities uh, California Collaborative, which is 20 of the most progressive cities in California on climate. Um, we do belong to a number of other networks. Um, I do also want to mention that there is a regional energy network that's being stood up by AMBAG, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, in 2025. And the purpose of the REN, the Regional Energy Network, is to provide incentives, training, and all those, fill those gaps in, in uh, needs that we have to really um, bring energy efficiency electrification to our region. Um, so we're really excited about that. Next year, we have a, a resiliency planner that's going to be joining um, our team, which we're really excited <laughs> about, particularly with all of the work that's going on on coastal resilience that I'll share with you. And we're hoping for an energy manager position in the next couple years, as called out in the Climate Action Plan. Just a bit on health and all policies. Um, we do, health and all policies is an international framework um, that's really utilized uh, in very different ways by different uh, entities to prioritize the three pillars of equity, public health, and sustainability, and recognize that um, there are cross-sectoral collaborative relationships needed in order to advance these priorities. And in doing so, uh, we as local government will improve community well-being outcomes across equity, public health, and sustainability. So we have an ordinance and a city council policy, both of which were adopted in 2019. 
one of which requires addressing the three pillars meaningfully on all the agenda reports. So that's something that you all could be looking for or should be looking for. Um, we are uh, doing training to try to gain more compliance, but the thought there is that by providing you all as advisory body members and our council a more holistic and integrated discussion of those three pillars, it really will help to enhance the body of information you have in making decisions and recommendations. Um, in 2021 through 2024, we have a three-year adopted work plan. We also adopted community well-being outcome indicator metrics, seven pages of them, actually. So we update those every two years. Those indicators are things that shift more on the decadal scale. They're not something that we're expecting year to year to make big gains. So that's something that we're tracking as well, are our efforts resulting in improve community well-being. And in 2021, uh, Council also adopted an anti-racial discrimination resolution, which really revived a, a formal health and all policy city council committee that really shepherds, has a very robust work plan, and shepherds quite a bit of work um, through the city. Uh, let's see here. Just a few things about training. Um, this is something that we saw in the demographic survey for advisory uh, bodies is that they really wanted more information about how do we integrate health and all policies into our work as commission members. So I'm gonna point out that the advisory body handbook has been revised and it's going to be made available very shortly by the city clerk to include some links to these two other things, to the agenda report gui guidance, so you can kind of see what staff are, are following to, in order to craft this language for you to consider, and a 30-minute training video that's just on health and all policies itself. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, this QR scan tag, of course, you're going to get this at the end um, or after this meeting, links to other foundational uh, background information as well as those metrics. Um, a couple things in the advisory body handbook includes how to request interpretation or translation services. It talks about this agenda report guidance. So I think there's, there's stuff in there that will be really relevant for you all. On the work plan currently for health and all policies, that um, city council committee is shepherding the gas leaf blower um, ordinance, which is going into its second reading on Tuesday of next week. Um, we are also, um, we are in a multi-year initiative to increase diversity and representation on city committees and commissions, thus the demographic survey to track that. That's the only uh, reason that we do that survey. Um, our HR department is currently developing a diversity, equity, inclusion, and access statement and program. This has long been on the work plan. And we are in the third year of integrating health and all policies into budget decision making making the three pillars actual criteria in the decisions for capital improvement program projects. This year we didn't have investment in CIP, um, but next year we will. Of course, CORE, the uh, collective of results and evidence-based investments, comes through health and all policies, and we do a number of grants. For example, one you might be interested in is preserving and promoting housing affordability and climate resilience in frontline communities in Santa Cruz, a HUD Pro housing grant that we're think we're getting, which would be great, but we, we are still waiting to hear. On the right, you can see some of those targets for commissions and committees. We really wanted to focus on increasing uh, the Latinx uh, representation and renters, which are critically underrepresented on it, current advisory bodies. And we're working with Parks and Rec and exploring how youth can integrate into committees and commissions. So more to, more to come on that. Transitioning to the Climate Action Plan, uh, we first adopted uh, a plan in 2012. We then came back and updated that plan adopted in 2022 with a three-year implementation work plan that we're still working on. As you can see on the right-hand side, I think everyone knows that transportation um, is our largest source of emissions by far. However, these are just the emission sectors that are regulated by the state. We did a more comprehensive life cycle greenhouse gas emissions inventory and found that actual emissions are 4.4 times the emissions that are regulated by the state. So we've brought in other things like um, how can we discourage um, air travel? How can we increase plant-based food choices? Not things that we have direct decisions on, but we can do education and things like that. So we do have... Uh, actions in our plan. I've already mentioned the Regional Climate Project Working Group, so I won't mention that again. 
Um, but we do, for transparency and accountability purposes, disclose to the Carbon Disclosure Project. Um, and over the past couple of years, we have achieved an A or A minus rating, which only 100 cities in the world have done. Um, we have two targets that are associated with our cap. We have a CEQA or California Environmental Quality Act qualified target, it means it's legally defensible. It aligns with the state. It, that is a 40% emissions reduction by 2030 from 1990 levels. And recognizing that the state target really wasn't in alignment with what science says was is what we need to do, our council and our community recognized we need an aspirational target, and that's that carbon neutrality by 2035. We are in the process of updating our greenhouse gas inventory to 2022. Unfortunately, we do lag by a couple years to get that data, and we'll have that uh, done by the end of the summer. Our CAP does have 152 measures and actions that span these different um, areas. And I will note to the topic of change management, about a third of those address organizational and structural change. So we really will be diving deep into those with our change management project. I'm not going to read all of these, but this is our climate action plan work plan right now that we're working on <laughs> point in time. Everything from updating our environmentally preferable purchasing policy to developing an energy efficient renovations policy that's actually going to be coming to the Planning Commission later this year in a few months. Um, active transportation plans in the process of being updated. Um, 800 trees are being planted through a USDA grant. Um, our solar, we have three new solar installations the city is putting online. Um, and we have the food scrap collection uh, rollout that continues. All of the ones that have asterisks are either funded by grants or have grants pending, which is a big part of how we get things done on climate um, is through grant funding. In terms of resiliency, we have a long history um, of climate adaptation planning and local hazard mitigation planning dating back to 2012. Um, our adaptation plan was one of the first in the state. And these are updated together on five-year uh, increments. We are in the process of updating them right now and merging them together into one plan document. Um, that effort will be complete by the end of the year, and we're hoping to have FEMA approval by April of next year, which, by the way, um, we it, it's in our interest to keep our local hazard mitigation plan updated and certified by FEMA because it makes us eligible for certain categories of pre- and post-hazard mitigation funding of which we take enormous advantage of. We have about 20 million pending right now um, related to that. And on average, about 7 million a year we bring in in those kinds of grants. Um, let's see here. On the resilience side, again, I'm not going to read all of this, but suffice it to say there's a lot going on, particularly on coastal resilience. You can see, I, I, first I want to give a shout out to the water department also. Um, they've been doing their water supply resiliency work in an adaptation context that has been really critical for their decision making and planning, but also is something that we're now using in the flood control and climate change study. So really piggybacking off what they have done. We have a, something you may be interested in. We have a local coastal program amendment that working closely with planning and others on that are incorporating sea level rise policies. Again, something that is uh, going to be done by the end of the year. And we've just kicked off a really exciting nature-based solutions and sand management feasibility study. So a lot of engagement coming on all of that. Um, one other thing is we're transitioning on West Cliff and some of our other coastal areas from visioning to implementation uh, planning. And we just got a grant for that. So that's really good news. Lastly, uh, change management. So, you know, in Santa Cruz, we've really taken advantage of a lot of the low-hanging fruit. And we do need to go deeper. We need to look at our processes, our policies, and understand where can we make changes so that we really can achieve these targets and make this transformational change that we need to make. So first thing, the climate advisory format. We asked a question on the demographic survey about your preferences for what, sh how should climate, how should the advisory body look like for climate? And the preference out of three options, one was let's make a super commission made up of other commission, all these commission members. Number two, let's have a standalone commission just on climate that sees a subset of projects. And um, number three, 
let's just integrate it into all the commissions and not have another commission. So the preference was actually creating a super commission. And what we've recommended to council, this is going to council also next week, is uh, to create a super commission of the four major commissions, including the planning uh, commission, that also includes three members of the public and youth. And so that's our recommendation. Um, it will likely be a Brown Acted um, uh, committee. It's, we're gonna try it as a one-year pilot. So you'll be hearing more on that and eventually we'll be asking one of you to join that. Um, we're also gonna be doing- and Do they have any direct budget control or just like kind of through reporting to council? No like direct budget control, no. I can always dream. <laughs> um, we also have, a, we will be conducting a facilitated exploration looking at our equity capacity readiness, which we lasted five years ago. Our, what we've been doing through health and all policies, is it making a difference um, in terms of how we address equity? We also really um, will be cultivating champions and buy-in. Champions are so important in this work, which is often viewed as an extra. So we really want to cultivate champions in, in, um, in this work. And then also the importance of collaboration across our departments and our community. Um, we have a number of things on pol policy and process shifts that we'll be looking at, including revenue generation, potentially from a climate resilience district, or a number of other measures that are called out in our cap that we could evaluate. Um, and other workforce development is, is always um, something that we are integrating into our different projects. And we have a, a citywide um, a team that actually has grown to be somewhat regional in nature. That's And the green jobs is a big part of that. In fact, our cap, we projected over 2,400 jobs would be generated by implementing our climate action plan. And my last slide is to encourage you to please, this is my call to action, join Resilient Santa Cruz. I know some of you already have, um, but this is our community activation platform where you can figure out what's my greenhouse gas emissions um, impact, and then it tailors uh, actions for you based on your lifestyle, if you're a renter or whatnot. It's kind of fun, there's prizes, you can team up, you could do a planning commission team if you wanted to. At any rate, have to give the plug for the call to action. Um, and that's all I have for you. Thank you so much. I know that's a lot of information. Um, I hope it was digestible and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Wise West. Um, any questions? Seeing none, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is number 3715 Graham Hill Road, and this is on our consent agenda. So um, does anybody have any questions about this item, or does anybody want to pull it? Uh, excuse me, Chair. I just wanted to note that you received a set of revised conditions earlier. Make sure that you all received that, and those were... Um, uh, pretty un unsubstantial changes just related to the timing of some of the conditions in relation to the overall project. So I took a look at those and I'd like to move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Any further discussion? No? Okay. Let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Paul Hamas? Yes. Okay, and we're moving. Uh, on to general business. Item number four is 1307 and 1313 Seabright, um, the Pacific Cultural Center. And I believe we have a staff presentation first. Yes, yes thank you. Um, I just have a brief summary of the, the issue. Um, so in May, the city received notification from the school district that they plan to acquire the property at 1307 and 1313 Seabright Avenue and the um, adjacent parking lot, and that they plan to use the site for student drop-off and pickup, as well as um, staff and teacher uh, professional mm -hmm. development, um, and then other uses as they deem appropriate. Per their website, they are considering demolition of the buildings or remodeling. They have not indicated to us which way they want to go. Um, so the school district is not subject to our zoning ordinance. Uh, this is just for the establishment of classroom facilities, but I understand that that term has been very broadly defined by the courts and our um, 
city attorney's opinion is that these uses that they're proposing would fall under that definition. Um, while they're not subject to permits, this body, the Planning Commission, is able to make a determination of general plan consistency. And while ultimately the school district can override that determination, um, we're recommending that the city take this opportunity to put our support and also concerns on the record. Um, so we had four main concerns. These are based on the general plan policies that are listed in the staff report. Uh, the first is 1307 Seabright. That is a historic building. It's listed in volume three of the city's historic building survey. We would like to see that building preserved and any um, alterations to the building we would want to see um, be found consistent with the Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, two, 1313 Seabright appears to be a residence. We could not find permits on file that would have changed that designation, although we understand at some point it was used for the Pacific Cultural Center. We would recommend that the um, school district meet all state requirements for um, tenant relocation assistance and replacement housing if they are subject to those things. Um, we would also recommend the school district prepare a traffic study and work with the Public Works Department to ensure that the pickup drop-off use does not negatively impact any of the surrounding streets. Um, and I will note that I, um, I understand the school district has reached out to the, plan, the Public Works Department already, and they have a meeting set up, so hopefully that coordination is, has already begun. Um, and then finally, there are some large trees on the site. Those could qualify as heritage trees. We would like to see those trees preserved and maintained in good condition. Um, and then also preservation of the site landscaping, especially the landscaping at the front edge of the property. Um, so the recommendation is that uh, compliance with these conditions would make the use consistent with the general plan um, and uh, or more consistent with the general plan. And it would meet other general plan goals that um, encourage the city to work with the school district to obtain the facilities they need. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, any questions for staff? Oh, I, I would also note that we did receive some letters of public correspondence also. Everybody get those? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, seeing no questions from members of the commission, uh, we can open the public comment period. Um, is there anybody here that wishes to speak on 1307 and 1313 Seabright tonight? Okay, seeing none, we'll return. One. Oh, one. Okay, come on up, sir. <coughs> and you'll have up to three minutes. Okay, thank you, commissioners. My name is Joe Michalak. I'm a member of the City of Santa Cruz Historic Preservation Commission. And we would have taken this topic up had we had a meeting this month, but three of us got together and wrote a document that we, I think it was passed out. Do you have it in your email? I have hardbound copies if you desire. Yeah, we all got it in our email. Okay, email good. So I just want to cover, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to cover some major points that we wanted to make to the Planning Commission, to the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, first of all, uh, we think the building should be saved, and if that means seismic retrofit, that would be appropriate as long as it adheres to Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. And there are numerous buildings in Santa Cruz that have been rehabilitated after the 89 quake. I know with the Pacific Cultural Center, there was some work done in 1990. Uh, we have a request in for permits to find out exactly what kind of work was done so that we have it up, up to date. And I know, obviously, the Earthquake standards for schools might be different than other buildings, but I'm not familiar with that. So some background. Uh, this building was approved by the City Council back in 2013 when it was evaluated for addition to the City's Historic, Pres uh, historic Building Survey in 2013. So the we have an evaluation that was done, and I can just bring on a couple of points from the evaluation in terms of the historic uh, architectural uh, integrity of the building. The evaluation noted that 
Uh, the church building, this is a direct quote, the church building related complex is a distinctive and exceptional design and that the building possesses special aesthetic merit and value due to its quality of its architecture. Now, we don't know who the architect was. That kind of information is a little bit dicey. It's, it's not often given for buildings that are old. This one was built in 1948, 49, after the war. So we're still researching to see if we can find out if there's an architect of great distinction uh, as opposed to the 1928 Galt Elementary School across the street, which was uh, designed by, uh, well, John J. Donovan, but there's some dispute over that in terms of exactly who did it. Uh, but it is a fine example of uh, Spanish revival architecture, as you can tell. And we think it would make a nice contribution to keep both of those buildings together because they make a nice statement. Any of it, uh, this statement is from myself, you, Jessica Cush. You can continue Cush, your comments. Yeah, go ahead. Jessica Cush and Don Lawrence. And, and if we had a meeting, we would discuss this at the HPC because we have three people in the business, uh, Sean Wilson, uh, Bill Schultz, and David Subak. So we would have had more uh, input in terms of uh, seismic information. But basically, we think the building should be uh, saved and restored and retrofitted if necessary. Any questions? OK. Yeah, in, the, in the end, was it added to the historic registry or not? Pardon me? In the end, was it added to the historic registry or not? Is it had been added to the, to the historic registry? You meant, well, it's, it's a nice it's, building, but it is it, eligible it for the California Register, okay. which is a high standard yeah. of approval. Okay. And it's a city landmark since it's been added to the volume three of the Historic Building Survey. Any questions? No. I was just going to add that we looked at the um, at one of the registries, the Bird Registry. And um, it was not on there. So um, to our knowledge, it's not on the state registry. It's, it's eligible. It's eligible. It's not. Yes. Yeah, eligible. there are lots of buildings like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else wish to make public comment on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the commission for deliberation and action. Any comments? Commissioner Dan. So, is, is what is that, what are our what can we do? Like, um, I mean, I understand the state uh, the school districts aren't subject to our land use rules, but with regard to historic buildings, like, what are our options besides just saying please keep this? Or is that it? That's generally it. Okay. Um, yeah, it, they're not subject to a permit through us, which is where we would um, regulate that, and which would also be subject to CEQA, which we could also help regulate that. But um, because there's no permits involved, um, we would just include this in our recommendation. And they may be subject to CEQA um, through the state when they get their permit. I don't know if that would include uh, our local listing as a consideration? I don't know if Alex. Because I'm just thinking, you know, that that means then they could tear down Galt School and rebuild Galt School, even though Galt School is clearly historic. They could. Yeah, yeah I think the intention is just to, um, you know, encourage them to work with us and, and end up with a good project that support, supports both of our goals. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? Well, it's a beautiful building, and the school just spent a bunch of bond funding. I'm on the committee, and they've done a nice job, like, keeping their historic buildings historic, in my opinion, including Galt. So I bet I'd, you know, at the most, I'd support a recommendation to preserve it if feasible, understanding that doesn't have much, many teeth to it. I'd still be happy to say that. I would support that. I mean... I, I would also just say, in my experience, Santa Cruz City Schools especially isn't interested in building from the ground up if they don't absolutely have to. So it's not just from an economic perspective, it's difficult to start from scratch when 
you know, you're using bond money or tax tax dollars to do it. So I think, you know, more of what we're doing, I think, is just general plan consistency and making some recommendations. So if uh, somebody wants to put a motion out on the floor in terms of a, a recommendation and see if we can get a second. And move I'll move that way. approval um, with the, the staff recommendation and maybe add in a direction that it's the sense of the commission to preserve the historic building. We have a motion on the floor. I'll second that. And a second. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, should we get the, do we need to put a recommendation up on the board here just so the public can see it or should we just um, go from here? I think we're good. I don't good? have, as long as you understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't okay. want to like piss off the city and the computer system. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened before. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right, then. Let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Mohamed? Yes. Okay, and that moves us to item number five, and we will open the public hearing. This is on private property outdoor seating. Um, I think first we have a staff presentation, and here comes staff. Take your time. Why don't, we, why don't we take a couple minute break here and let's, yeah, why don't we just take a couple minutes here and so until our staff gets set. Okay, looks like our staff is ready, almost. We're ready, sorry about that. Okay, so we are back. Uh, item number five, private property outdoor seating. Um, let's hear the staff presentation. Take it away. Thank you, and good evening, commissioners. My name is Clara Stanger. I'm a senior planner with the Department of Planning and Community Development. I am here with Rebecca Unit, who is the Economic Development Manager, and we will be co-presenting this presentation this evening. Um, so two months ago, um, we were here and we gave a presentation on um, a proposed um, ordinance and process for private property outdoor seating 
Um, and we got several questions from the commission and were asked to come back, and here we are. So, um, so I want to give a quick overview of um, the outreach and the policy development that has gone into this process. Um, so this started a year ago in June of 2023. Um, we've been working with the City Council subcommittee for this um, particular topic, and we've had seven meetings um, so far. We had uh, four last year and three so far this year. We had three community meetings, two in September of 2023. Um, at that time, we also did a community survey and gathered a lot of information. And then between September and February, uh, we did a lot of internal work to make some changes and make things better based on all the feedback that we got from the community and from the subcommittee. Um, and then we came back and had another community meeting in March of this year. Um, and we had um, a public hearing a couple months ago. And here we are at our second public hearing. We're going to have two more in the future. Um, with city council, uh, first reading and a second reading um, for the proposed ordinance. And here's a quick overview of where we started. So we have an existing process for allowing outdoor dining patios. Um, that process requires an administrative use permit, um, which is a public hearing approved by the zoning administrator. Um, sometimes, it might require a special use permit if there's a certain like, non-conforming um, alcohol use on the site. Um, a design permit is also required to create a new outdoor dining patio. And then once the applicant obtains both of those entitlements, then they move to the building permit stage and, uh, and get their building permit. Um, we then um, wanted to make that a bit easier. And so we initially proposed to have um, different processes depending on how close the business is to a residential zone. So if the, if the business is more than 50 feet from a residence, then it would be a use permit, but with a staff level review and no public hearing, and then they would move to a building permit. If the business was within 50 feet of a residential zone, then they would still need the public hearing and then move on to a building permit. So, um, our proposed process now is simpler again. Um, it's just a building permit. And that is um, as long as the patio meets all of the design standards and operational standards. If they want to deviate from that, then they can get a design permit or they can, or they can seek out a use permit. Um, but otherwise, it's building permit only. Um, and if the patio is less than 300 square feet and there are no permanent overhead structures, then it's an hourly review. Um, it's a standard building permit review if the patio is more than 300 square feet or more um, or permanent structures. And in addition, we do not require replacement parking. Under our current regulations, they would require to replace any required parking that's being removed. Um, and then again, there's no planning um, use permit or design permit required. So, um, so what does that do? That basically saves about $7,000 in fees that would have been spent on applying for a planning permit. Um, and I already went over that they can deviate from standards by getting a use permit or design permit. So if they want, they can go pay the fees and do something fancy. Um, um, a building permit is always required, and this comes up a little later in the presentation. Um, a state law, it's required under the state building code. There's no getting around a building permit. Um, and again, there's those two levels of review, and the 300 square foot is the threshold that we did some more work looking at, and we still landed on it. Um, so now I'm going to go through um, some of the questions that were brought up at the last planning commission meeting. And then after this slide, I will pass it over to Rebecca and she will go into a little more depth into some of the other questions. So the first question, can a simple building permit review be expanded beyond 300 square feet? No, it cannot um, because there are specific um, 
regulations relating to accessibility and occupancy, specifically plumbing fixtures, that there's no way to expand that threshold in order and still meet the um, state building code requirements. Um, so the second question was whether Assembly Bill 2017, or I'm sorry, 1217 from 2023 um, provided any relief with regard to um, having to meet the building code requirements um, for making these patios permanent. Um, and the answer is no. What this bill does is it provides um, some relief for um, alcohol beverage control permits. Um, it provides some relief for replacement parking and uh, for health and safety codes related to satellite kitchen facilities. Um, and that basically extends those COVID provisions until July of 2026. But there's nothing that says that, um, that the building code will not apply in any way um, to make these patios permanent. Um, another question was whether these temporary patios can just be grandfathered in um, by allowing them to remain indefinitely without building permits. The answer is no. Um, the state building code requires building permits and if you don't do a building permit, then you're not following the state law. Um, how are the outdoor seating areas for restaurants and bars functionally different and how do the different rules apply to each type of establishment? Um, this is something that we actually started discussing in June of last year and we we discussed it pretty in depth with the um, subcommittee. And um, after what we landed on was that the really, the biggest functional difference between the two is noise. Bars tend to be open later. Maybe there's more drinking. When there's more drinking, people get louder. And so that's the biggest impact on the neighborhood is more noise and later at night. Um, the proposed, um, operational standards require any patio, whether it's a bar or restaurant, to close down at 10 p.m. And that is consistent with the city's noise ordinance. So that kind of creates an equal playing field for both of these types of uses. Um, so with that standard apply, um, functionally they will, be, um, they will be pretty similar when it comes to the impact on the neighborhood. Um, and then the last question um, was about how the city would enforce the development and operational standards since there is no use permit required. Um, and the answer is it's basically the same. So um, the enforcement process involves um, a courtesy notice. It involves um, working with the property owner to resolve the issue. Um, there are certain pressures that the city can apply, including recording a notice of violation on the property or applying um, some different types of financial penalties. <coughs> and those typically are enough to bring um, a, an issue into compliance. Um, when there is a use permit, there is an option to um, recommend um, changes to the conditions or revoking of the use permit. That is something that is done very rarely. It takes a lot of staff time to document and to and to bring that forward. Um, and code compliance staff has indicated that their typical process with uh, financial penalties and notices of violation are um, pretty much always enough to keep, um, to resolve issues. So um, by removing any use permit or design permit requirement, it's not really going to make um, a very big difference in the way that any issues would be enforced. Okay, and with that, I am going to move it over to Rebecca. Great, thank you. Um, so another question that we had was to uh, provide some more information about what other jurisdictions have been doing around private property outdoor seating. Um, so we have been researching other jurisdictions throughout the state since we started this process in um, last year. Uh, and we did some further analysis and that was provided as an attachment uh, to the report. But we looked at 14 different cities uh, throughout the state. Um, in all of these cities, building permits were required. The majority of these cities do still have discretionary permits. Um, so there are additional planning permits that businesses need to obtain. Um, 
through our research, we really followed the track that the city of San Diego um, has put into place with allowing these outdoor seating areas as uh, by right use and requiring that building permit as the only approval mechanism. Um, the only city that you know could be considered more lenient than what we're proposing today is the city of Fremont. They do have a specific reference to up to 750 square feet is allowed through their outdoor commercial um, patio permit. However, it also says that they need to comply with all uh, state building code requirements. Um, and through a staff's review and actual discussions with the city of Fremont staff, um, we weren't able to substantiate that 750 square foot um, size as meeting all of the codes of the building. Um, the building code. And so uh, the other feedback we received from talking with City of Fremont staff was that um, the majority of their outdoor spaces are significantly smaller than 750 square feet. Um, they also have more restrictions in place in terms of um, their size limitations being restricted to only four parking spaces and still needing to meet um, additional on-site parking requirements, which, are, which is something that we have removed um, with not requiring replacement parking and not having a maximum size in place for our proposal. Um, and they also require use permit modifications if a business is subject to a conditional use permit. Um, in their example, that would be a bar um, is subject to a conditional use permit, so needs to obtain that planning permit as well before they can uh, receive this outdoor commercial patio permit. Um, we looked at the question of different hours of operation uh, in proximity to residential. Uh, the cities that we found with some different requirements there were the cities of San Jose and San Diego. Um, if a business is within 150 feet of residential, they do limit the hours of operation to 9 p.m. on weeknights and then 10 p.m. on the weekends. Um, and then when we looked more locally at what other uh, jurisdictions have done in the county of Santa Cruz, um, no other jurisdictions have made uh, significant streamlined programs. The county of Santa Cruz has made some updates uh, through their sustainability update that they approved. Um, however, there are still discretionary permits required. Um, they have a 12 seat cap for more of that administrative process and then they require um, a he full hearing review uh, for greater than 12 seats. Uh, they also still require full parking requirements and even um, require some traffic impact studies uh, depending on the scale of those uses. Uh, so Another question that came up was sort of looking at what is this uh, real cost of the regulations on businesses um, and looking at uh, if we could sort of tease out how this would play out for businesses. Um, because all of the businesses that are currently in the temporary program are so different in terms of size, scale, their site, uh, unique site constraints, and just the nature of their buildings themselves, we're not able to really dive in with that level of detail. Um, we did try to see what plans we had on file in terms of past permits that have been uh, approved. The most recent plans we found were from 2012, and we just don't have sufficient information to be able to provide a real analysis of that. Um, to, to do that um, in reality. So instead, we looked at three projects that have been pro the approved. The last permitted one was 2012? Uh, the last tenant improvement or yeah, change to a property that we found on file for these was from 2012. Okay. Um, the, so we looked at three projects that have been approved in the last two years. Um, all of these business were, businesses were actually uh, operating with temporary expansion permits during COVID and decided to move forward with permanent expansions before we adopted these changes. Um, to give uh, a few different ranges of scale, uh, just for some perspective, we're only focusing on permitting costs because we don't have their true uh, construction costs, but just to give that um, variation there. So a small project, 600 square foot, new outdoor seating area um, with permanent structures, so overhead structures, um, serving three businesses. It didn't trigger any restroom improvements, um, and their building permits were just around $3,000. Um, then a medium project uh, expansion from 300 square feet to six, about 600 square feet um, outdoor patio uh, included some interior remodel work but didn't, have, didn't require any uh, modifications to their restrooms. Uh, they did have planning fees around $3,800 um, for their... Uh, use modification and then building permits were around seven thousand dollars and then a large project um, this is a major remodel including interior changes an expansion of their outdoor patio um, and then they made changes to their restroom to make them unisex to accommodate that increase in occupancy uh, their planning fees were around 1700 and uh, building permits were around eleven thousand seven hundred
Uh, so as we looked at additional ways to reduce, you know, remodel costs or permit costs with this, um, you know, we're really within the parameters of the building code and sort of the framework that we're working on, um, you know, the, the lowest cost sort of range of option here is that um, under 300 square feet. Um, our building department is able to do that through our hourly review, you know, having a really rough site plan, not requiring architectural drawings, um, and the hourly rate of $142 per hour. We've removed all of our discretionary permit requirements. Um, and these changes, if approved, that's removing those discretionary permits going forward. So any expansion to outdoor seating is only going to require a building permit going forward. Um, so a business could you know, expand as they want to through that building permit process as they're able. Um, additionally, knowing that restrooms could be one of the most common you know, impacts from this expanded occupancy, uh, the allowance of having temporary restrooms during a remodel to allow for operational, uh, you know, continue to be operational. Uh, we also looked at, you know, would it be viable to have temporary port bodies long term as, you know, restroom costs are um, expensive. Rental of those portable restrooms could be quite um, expensive as well, but we also are not recommending that um, just because of potential nuisance impacts, citing those on a property. Um, a lot of these properties are really adjacent, you know, close adjacency to other businesses or potentially residential. Um, so that's not something we would recommend, but it is something that we did explore just as another option. Um, so just to wrap up our presentation here, um, you know, the next steps under our proposed uh, process that um, we're seeking recommendation for, from you uh, today is, um, you know, eliminating our discretionary permits, only requiring building permit, uh, and then setting up these two frameworks, allowing for the hourly review, um, and then going through the standard uh, building permit review process for those larger uh, than 300 square feet or permanent structures. I will welcome any questions or comments. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Any questions from commissioners? Commissioner yes. Um, I have some questions about the F city of Fremont and its relationship to our 300 square feet. So I just want to make sure I understand their interpretation of what they're comfortable with as a city is 750 square feet. And it's our city's interpretation that it's 300. Is that correct? I'll let John weigh in on more of the particulars, but um, their 750 square foot is only looking at um, things that trigger the fire code pieces. They're not actually looking at the occupancy piece of it. Um, however, their code does still say that they should be um, the so they're you know they've come to a, a council directed this is sort of how they're looking at it but it doesn't um, from our understanding fully meet the the code but I'll let John get into more of the specifics so it's it's not that the city is limiting them to 300 square feet it's where we have some could you could you speak in the mic sorry okay thank you I, I usually talk loud enough that you hear me around the block, but <clears throat> um, it's, it's not that we're limiting them to the 300 square feet. It's just that's where we can say that you're not going to be required any additional restrooms. You'll probably find that going back through some of the old plans, and of course, it depends on, you know, you, you're familiar with the architecture. So anyway, in the codes. Um, some of these, these structures were put together way back under a different code. They had different requirements, but to meet the current code, um, if you get much over that 300 square feet, we thought that was um, very lenient to allow them the 30 square feet per person for uh, plumbing fixture calculations versus what the plumbing code actually says is to use the same 15 square feet per person that you would use for exiting. On, on the hand of uh, Fremont, they're just saying that they shall not exceed 750 square feet. Doesn't mean you get to go up to 750 square feet and not have to put any new bathrooms in or anything else. 
if you keep reading the planning ordinances and it says, and you shall follow all building and fire codes as adopted by the state of California in Title 24. So I, I, I think people are being dismayed by the 300 square foot. It was, it was the, the threshold that we were trying to find that we could allow them the most without forcing them into doing extra things. So thank you. Any other questions? I'll wait to hear from the public. Okay. Um, at this time, we will open up the public comment period. How many people wish to speak on this item? Just get a sense of time. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Okay, great. Um, if you could come line up over here to your right, my left, and uh, sign in if you, w if you wish. You'll have up to... Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, uh, let's say two minutes. I'm still Anina Van Alstyne, and I don't know who that gentleman was who just spoke, but I really appreciate what he said. Just for the purpose of a visual, 300 square feet is about as big as from this bar to halfway to the second bench. 300 square feet does not allow a lot of tables. So I'm back here in the realm of hopeless, romantic, old-time Santa Cruz person. I moved out of the country to Seabright so that I could walk to La Posta and drink and walk home. I did that last night. The restaurant was full. It was neighbor night. I'm very attached to La Posta. I'm attached to Linda Seabreeze Cafe. There are other local restaurants that have been here for a long time for which the outdoor dining helped them get through COVID. It helped them survive. George Owl wrote a beautiful letter, opinion to the Sentinel about why are we as a, as a community now wanting to kick these small businesses in the knees and take them down because there's no physical place at either La Posta or Linda's to put a second bathroom and they really need the outside space. And there are other restaurants in town where I won't go because they're too loud unless I can sit outside. And again, these other communities are being used as a standard, but I wish that you would consider that this is a community. Tandy Beale wrote, a, you know who Tandy Beale is, right? Do you guys know who Tandy is? Did you see her letter to the editor? She doesn't go downtown anymore because it's being sucked out of its charm. But she does go to La Posta with me, and she and Peggy Snyder that founded the Picky, Pickle Family Circus say that that's like the old Santa Cruz. And you can just kick that place to their knees by requiring them to put in another bathroom, by requiring them to do engineering. They pass, they have a building permit, they have a use permit, they're a viable business in our community. So is Linda's, so are the other small restaurants in town. Can you please try to find a workaround and keep these restaurants alive, please? Thank you. Next speaker. Well, speaking of La Posta, my name is Patrice Boyle. I am the owner of La Posta, and I had a long thing to read, but I just want you to know we opened in 2006. We made a garden in the, in the parking lot. When COVID happened, we put in a dining area next to the garden. We were outside and eating outside. Our patrons, our, our workers were working outside because we were concerned about everyone's health and the health of the community. So what we have done is in with respect to the health of the community. Even though the di outdoor dining has been wildly popular, popular outcome, the city of Santa Cruz has seems to have decided that such patios require new building permit, permits and seems willing to decrease outdoor dining space by significantly more than 50%. 300 square feet, as we said, can seat about 10 people. The city is requiring full new building permits for more than 300 square feet, which could include, but not limited to, additional restrooms, newer up and upgraded trash enclosures with running water, septic sewer hookups, and fire suppression systems, new ADA upgrades, possibly new entrances and exits for restaurants that have been existing and in compliance for decades. 2012 was the last one, there you go. These costs can run into hundreds of thousands of dollars for restaurants that, number one, don't have the funds, and number two, don't even own the, the business, the, the space, right? In some places, 
restaurants are going to have increased rent because of the benefit that they bring to the landlord. This is like really, really unfair. And the landlords are not going to pay for anything. I can guarantee you that. Tonight, I am asking you to uh, be creative and proactive in a search for a solution to this regulatory issue and extend this project until the end of um, 2026 in uh, concert with the state of California. And go ahead and finish your comments. I would just like, you know, Rebecca has outlined what 14 different cities are doing. And I think it's really important to listen to what they're doing. We don't have to follow any one of those particular specific things. We can take the best from each part and make a really forward thinking, creative and beneficial plan for Santa Cruz. It's Santa Cruz, we have the best weather in the world. We should be able to sit outside and the COVID really brought everyone outside, and it's a great thing. And it's wildly, wildly popular all across the city. So I think I would like the city to join creatively with the people who are trying to make this happen and, and put something together that really works. I mean, take the best part, be liberal, be forward-thinking, be... Um, helpful. Be helpful. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I don't want to thank cut you. off your monologue. That's okay. but That's fine. Yeah. I'm done. Thank you. Next speaker, please. So I had a question first. Uh, I, was, I received an email from staff saying that we had until Wednesday at noon to submit my written comments, and I submitted them at Wednesday at 1130, but apparently Wednesday was a holiday. Uh, it's a relatively new one. And, but it's a great one, Juneteenth. So my question is, have you received the written comments that I sent in? Thank you very much. Nice, actually. Thank you. My name is Enda Brennan. I'm a recently a retired uh, downtown commission member. There is no urgency to pass anything tonight. The city outdoor dining program currently has an expiration date of May 31st, 2025, which can be extended. California state law AB 1217 allows any existing outdoor dining ordinance to be able to stay in effect until July 1st, 2026, more than two years from now. I urge the commission chair to appoint an ad hoc committee of subcommittee of three members to examine the Fremont ordinance in detail and come back to this commission sometime this fall or early next year with a version of the Fremont Ordinance for adoption. Proposed ordinance in front of you that uses a 300 square foot number for limited review is a completely arbitrary number. The Fremont number of 750 square feet allows for greater flexibility in meeting the needs of outdoor dining and recognizes the crucial public health benefits of outdoor dining. Fremont Ordinance with the 750 feet number allows for the zoning administrator to act with ministerial authority, still has numerous safeguards built into the ordinance. According to the Fremont Senior Deputy City Attorney Heather Lee, there has been no legal challenge to their using this 750 square foot number. Joel Pullen, the Fremont City Zoning Administrator, says there has been no pushback and that the process approval has been smooth and highly functional. His building department, Fremont's building department official, suggested the 750 square foot number for ministerial approval and wanted additional requirements for anything over that number. In closing, study the Fremont ordinance and act in the best interest of the public and our local restaurants. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Nathan Van Zant, and I own and operate Shanty Shack Brewing. And uh, we have uh, inside about 600, maybe 700 square feet, and we have two bathrooms. And uh, it seems to do the job. What I've noticed after COVID was that most people don't even sit in my tasting room anymore. They get a beer and immediately walk outside and enjoy our kind of garden patio that we've built. Uh, and they really love it. Everybody seems to like it. So. Perhaps this, I know that there's, you know, there's, there's uh, ordinances for plumbing and all that stuff that dictate 
what kind of, uh, you know, how many bathrooms we should have. Uh, but, I mean, it seems that my tasting room has become circulation now. So perhaps there's a way we can rewrite some of that to include a better working terminology of what these, uh, you know, I guess they are a state, it is a state run kind of thing. But so I understand kind of working in a hard place. But these patios have been vital for us. Uh, everybody wants to drink beer and eat food outside, um, as well as enjoying music outside. So this has, like, it, after COVID, everything kind of changed. So I think I'm urging you to kind of try to help us out in keeping these patios because without them, them, I'm pretty sure that our business would fail. So that's that's sort of my two cents. Um, I know cost is 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 tremendous, and none of us here are we're working hard. And we don't have the extra money. Um, I got a I got an architectural review or an architectural quote for kind of doing the changes that we were looking at to be able to keep our patio, um, and it came in at like twelve or fifteen thousand dollars just for the architect to look at it. Um, in my in my experience, the building permits and all the all the reviews and the permits that while it's costly in time is only about twenty percent of the actual cost of a project. So when it says $11,000, you know, it's going to be more like five times that. And that's, that's just something that none of us really have. So any kind of help or bones that you guys can throw us, you know, we're, 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 we're here making Santa Cruz a destination and a place that people want to go eat and drink at. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, my name is Karen Madura, and um, I'm the owner of Brady's Yacht Club, the jury room, the acting manager of the Rush Inn, and um, the parish public house in Aptos. Um, I hope you all received my email regarding the private property patios. Um, and again, I'm here with everyone where we really appreciate so much hard work that the city has put into this, and um, they've engaged with us very much in this process, which we are so grateful for. Um, but we are really just asking for help um, in any way that we can be creative in allowing these patios to happen for us. Uh, 300 square feet is very small, and it goes against what um, people are asking for, really, and in, in enjoying. And um, having a cost of, you know, ten to fifty thousand dollars for this is um, just something that we cannot afford. Um, I would like to ask that the city look at these specific businesses that are in front of you because we are the ones that are engaged in this process and we are trying to find a way uh, to work with us and, and figure out something that can make all of us happy. Um, I would also ask that we do extend the temporary deadline um, that um, could give us a little bit more time. Um, in particular, um, I also wanted to ask about the rush in because it is slated to be demolished under the clock tower program and that would mean that that's something that we would not, I mean, there's, why would we apply for a patio if it's, you know, going to be torn down? So, and that I know is a particular instance, but these are 21 particular businesses in this community. Um, yeah, and I really just want to um, elevate Patrice's plea for creative help from the city. Um, we love being a part of Santa Cruz. We are a huge part of this. We employ here and we spend our money here as well. And we just really want to ask for any help that we can all come up with to make this work for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Andy Ritchie. I'm a Seabright resident, and just uh, earlier this evening started looking at the, the, I guess, justification for the 300 square foot limit on patios. And I just tried to find examples of other places in California that were doing uh, more. Pretty quickly came across, I think it was Covinda and Rockland. Rockland had a limit of a 400 square foot tent or larger because of fire regulations required an inspection. But it seems like if you just look at people trying to do larger, there are already examples. And so I would just like to underline what other people said. Like, um, we should be looking for how we can go bigger, 
Another thing I was thinking is that uh, it seems like it's occupancy related, uh, this 300 square foot limit. So even just having something like if you, if you stick with the existing occupancy requirements of, of a business um, and allow them to be inside or outside, then uh, it, you're not necessarily saying, oh, you have a, you have a larger occupancy requirement because they were already approved for that occupancy number with just inside those walls. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Hiram Coffey, and uh, I've been a bartender at Brady's Yacht Club for about two years now. Um, and again, like everyone said, during COVID, it really saved our business. And even now, COVID is still around. It's not going anywhere. And being able to provide a space uh, that is safe for many of our customers that are immunocompromised, I think, is integral. Um, moving out to those four wall walls really created a greater sense of community. Uh, not only within the bar, but within uh, the Seabright area. Um, you know, when we do our best to follow all the rules, we close at 10, we keep the noise down. Um, I, it is integral to our current business plan, and the amount of community events that we get to hold there are incredible, and in, I think that having these patios is, is vital to all local businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody wish to give, anybody else want to give public comment on this? Going once, going twice. Okay, then we will return to the commission for deliberation and action. Go ahead. Commissioner Gordon. I'm going to ask you, because I know you've been working on this, um, what is the urgency to cut this off now? I mean, we know right off the bat that it's going to cause financial burden to these 21 businesses. And um, I understand needing to get a plan in place to be compliant. Um, but is there an urgency to do that right this minute, or would you, you know, is that, yeah. So what's, what, tell me more about why we have to make this decision as a community right now. Uh, so the businesses uh, are currently operating under these temporary permits that were approved during the emergency conditions. So um, the parameters of those permits were set out that this was, uh, restriction on indoor operations, businesses needed to operate outdoors only. Um, we made very, very quick regulations that allowed these expansions. They were reviewed by economic development staff, not building professionals. Um, so as we've now come to full occupancy, you know, businesses are able to have indoor operations and ex you know, outdoor operations. Some of these spaces may have doubled their, you know, their full capacity, um, not having these permanent permits in place uh, is just something that we need to move forward. Our temporary permit, you know, they're really set on these emergency regulations and we don't have those emergency um, declarations in place anymore. And so being able to move forward um, with those, we've, we've done the same thing with our parklet program. Um, yeah. Right, which has also caused community havoc. <laughs> so I guess what I'm trying to, uh, I hear you, I hear you're trying to sort of check the box of like solving some outstanding COVID sort of unregulated things. Um, and I can appreciate that. But I also was the one that basically was, you know, brought up the last time you were here that we really have to uh, appreciate and understand the economic impact that this is going to have on these 21 businesses and the economic impact it's going to have on the city. It's a, it's a twofold. And so I guess I would, as a business person, would want to take advantage of a situation that would bring me more money as long as I possibly could. And since the state has said that we're not forced to make a decision about this until 2026 or have something in place is there 
I, I still don't understand the sense of urgency when we know that it's going to have a negative impact on both the city and the business owner. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I was surprised to hear that that after, I, know, I understand your explanation about why we didn't see actual building cost numbers um, or impact of those for these 21 businesses. I think that's what we asked for as a planning commission is like to see, like to, for this, for the city to do the research to understand like the actual fiscal impact both to the business owner and to the city to have all the data. And I had spoken to some of the business owners who hadn't been reached out to since the last meeting here. So, um, but I think those business owners do have the information and understand similar to the gentleman that owns Shanty Shack of what the financial implications are gonna be of making the modifications, potentially, worst case scenario, which being in the business, you have to prepare your clients for worst case scenario financially. So the reality is for the community that's looking at those numbers that we brought up is that it's not $27,000, it's actually probably $100,000. I mean, I, I tried in my mind from an architect standpoint, like thinking through the scenario of the businesses that I know that with, if they had to add a bathroom would, or Patrice's situation where she can't actually add a bathroom, um, that it is a really significant impact. And so I'm still feeling like I'm given the same information and I feel the same way, <laughs> which is that we know other communities are doing other things we're not forced to make this a thing right at this moment. And so I do feel like there's possibilities. I mean, one of the the gentlemen that spoke from Seabright neighborhood is we could limit their occupancy. I know some businesses are doing that because they did double their occupancy in seats, but their kitchens can't actually handle it or their services can't actually handle it. So they're regulating themselves by not filling every seat. So. I think there are still ways, and I'm just, I know that the business community doesn't feel like we've exhausted every option, but I'm anyway, sorry that it took so much time, but I'm kind of passionate about this one, so. Don't be sorry, that was awesome. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Sure. Commissioner Dan? Well, I, I appreciate those comments and agree with them, and I just wanted to acknowledge um, the the length that staff did go to try to make this um, easier and, and eliminating a discretionary process is really significant. Um, and so I actually wasn't sure what we would get back and I was pretty shocked to see that um, you guys eliminated all discretion, which I actually had some questions for um, for a, a new use going in next to, um, within 50 feet of a residential um, home or district. Um, you know, I, I, I think we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out for um, new businesses going in that, that will just be able to put this in with no notice, no nothing, and the existing residents will have this new use next to it. Um, so I was pretty surprised to see that. Um, but I guess my question was, with regard to the Fremont example that, um, from what we understand, what I've, we're told is 700 uh, square feet, 750 square feet. But what I heard from our building official was that um, that they still have to conform with state um, and state state uh, building code, state fire code. So I guess I just wanted to further go down that road so we can understand that from my from my understanding. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, a lot of the constraint here is the state building code. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. That's our so, only regulatory factor. So we can't right do now. anything about that, right? Correct. Okay. So we like let's just put all that aside and we have to look at what are the other options. And it seems to me since we can't change that um, that the only other option is to look at it by occupancy. And so uh, you know, I don't I don't mind taking more time to do this um, and we have time and so, I mean, if that's something we want to explore further, that seems like that might be worthwhile. 
Um, but I guess I just want to, like, let's get out of this um, scenario where we're thinking that we can change the state building code, because we can't do that. It's kind of like state housing laws. We can't do anything about that. What can we do? Um, yeah, just to respond to that, so, and I'll let Matt go as well, um, you know, the, this 300 square foot framework that we're, um, we're sort of discussing was our attempt to just further streamline and provide that hourly review, thinking that with no other conditions changed, you want to have outdoor seating, we're not looking at anything inside your building, we're knowing that that's not going to trigger these additional occupancy you know, you don't have to hire an architect, you can get this seating. Um, recognizing that's smaller than what these businesses have, but that is a very, very, very streamlined path that no other city is doing. Yeah, um, I want to acknowledge that as well. Very. So, uh, and I, so I think, you know, still this is not perfect from the perspective of folks in the situation, but I, I just want to acknowledge that even just from when I came into this, it's come quite a long way. And so I, I want to acknowledge and appreciate that. Yeah, and, and just that, you know, we're not in any way limiting businesses to that. It's just that if you want to do an outdoor seating and you don't want to go through a big process, that's your framework to work from. It could be even that you have additional capacity, you know, as Nathan mentioned with his tap room, like maybe there are those interior reductions you can make, just that with us not having information about the building, wanting to create, you know, here's a scenario where you can guarantee to have outdoor dining, have it be a very low cost, that's what we were able to develop. Um, but through, you know, traditional building permit, which is the baseline requirement that every city requires, you know, you can get those additional sizes and you can figure out what you can do within your constraints. It's really what does the building code dictate on your particular property and how do we right size that? During these temporary permits, we didn't have any size restrictions. We didn't look at any of that. So businesses, you know, took up the space that they had. And so now as we have to put the rules into place again, there is that push and pull, and that's what we're trying to work with, and that's where we've tried to be creative. Um, 300 square feet is certainly not ideal, but we're working within the regulations that we have and trying to provide some solutions forward um, to make this work. Hi, Vice Chair and Commissioners. Matt Van Wa, Principal Planner for Advanced Planning. Uh, thanks for that, Rebecca. I just wanted to add on to those comments, too, and just say she said it exactly right, and, and so did you, Commissioner Dan. We are purely running into the building code here. Um, this, the city, all of us, all of us staff don't want that number. We, we wish it was higher as well and making it easier for everyone. Uh, but given that there is that number, we've researched it thoroughly. You know, there is going to be a time where we run into liability issues potentially with continuing to flout the building code and, and not following that. So that's a bigger overall concern. And, uh, you know, in running into that number, you know, flexible solutions were, were found as much as possible. And in looking at these 14 cities across the state, many of them very similar to Santa Cruz, uh, we didn't just take what was the best of each of those. We looked at all of them, and ours is the best of those. Um, it's by far the most lenient of, of all those examples. So we really did push the envelope as far as we could in this regard and we're just running into that building code now and we're at the point where the urgency ordinance is is running out and uh, we do want to give folks as much time as possible uh, to to begin working on that and uh, so I do also recommend if, if there's an interest uh, it sounded like there there is interest in continuing the item or something like that staff would prefer uh, that the commission vote either way so this can proceed uh, we've done extensive work with the community and uh, and our city council and I know our, our subcommittee members are very interested in talking about this further at that level thank you thank you any other questions or comments I have some but I'm saving them well Commissioner Kennedy I just I want to stick up for staff and for the code and like having the right number of bathrooms and accessibility. Those are all really good things. I have my house that small, like 300 feet. Like right, this room's 30 feet wide, and that would be 10 feet out. I mean, to me, that feels like a good big spot. I'm sure bigger is better uh, in terms of spaces. So I'm just like, I'm, I hear the business community, but I just feel like it's kind of disingenuous to say that we're kicking you in the shins and all this stuff when we're creating 
the most lenient ordinance in the state to enable these things to happen. In fact, like no review whatsoever up to 300 square feet. So I want to bring it back to that. Like, I think the idea in COVID was move those spaces outside and, you know, and now we're, we're just moving them back inside and that's like simple and not controversial. And, you know, that doesn't mean I'm against small businesses. It was an emergency. It's not. Code's going to apply again. Fair is fair. So um, while I'm sympathetic, I think we should adopt the staff recommendation and move on. And uh, as to like why, why keep this, why not give it more time? There's always the next level of council coming, and council directed us to do this, and we've had a long and good process. So I'm not sure more meetings where a few select parties come and continue to air their grievances is going to get us a better ordinance. Um, with respect and love to our businesses. So I say we voted through and move on. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a couple questions just about, um, number one, the, the Fremont um, ordinance. And as I read the staff report, um, the consequence for Fremont's current situation, which is uh, outdoor patio dining up to 750 feet, which puts them in violation of state building code, correct? It, Am I right so far on that? If, they, if, if a business was to do that. If they approved it without looking at the occupancy, yeah. Right. And provide those sufficient. Okay. And then um, as I read it, it looked like a, a matter of liability, right? If you're out of compliance there. Is that liability to the city or is that liability to the business? It could be to both. Could be both. Okay. Interesting. All right. And then um, my other question was in the difference between our existing ordinance and the one being proposed tonight in terms of compliance and action. So as I read it, in the existing ordinance, you're issuing, you know, a design permit or a use permit. And uh, to bring a business into compliance, it would be through conditions of approval with those permits. Now what we're moving to is more a code, a municipal code issue. There, the difference is very finite. It's very small, right? Um, but um, that looks more like monetary pen penalties rather than just shutting down an entire space through the conditions of approval, correct? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so, so either way, it would start with some kind of penalty if it's um, like a citation. Well, it would start with trying to work with the owner without that doesn't work, then it would move to maybe recordation of a notice of violation on the property or a citation or an administrative penalty. And the latter two are both uh, financial uh, penalties. Um, so whether it's a violation of a condition of approval or a violation of a standard that's baked into the code, that process is the same. The only difference is that if all of that fails, which is very, very rare, then um, if there is a use permit, then there could be a process where staff recommends changing the conditions of approval or revoking the permit as a last resort. And that could, that could shut down the patio, whereas, um, whereas when, it, when the standards are baked into the code and there's no use permit, there is no, the use is by right, so you can't revoke it. Got it. But you can still... The process to fix it is is basically as effective in both scenarios. Okay, got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, any commissioner yeah. Gordon? I, I just I still I feel like I still have to ask more questions. So thank you. I don't know if this is to Mr. Jeffersoni or I. I um, is uh, occupancy even up for discussion? I mean, is it possible that we could main, because the reality is, is we're talking 300 square feet. Nobody, it's like, that's not really the topic here because most of these people have more than 300 square feet. That's really the issue here. So we're, this is as nice as this is, as a, as a process, and I do appreciate it, it's not really affecting the people, the 21 businesses for the most part, you know, the ones that generate the most revenue. So I need to unpack this to see what our options are. Is limiting occupancy with this amount of square footage, like, is that even a reality? Is that possible legally? Like, Patrice keeps her 
outdoor seating and her indoor seating square footage as it is right now, but it still limits it to an occupancy that brings her to the threshold where she's still compliant with one restroom. It's specifically, specifically. Chief Building Official, City of Santa Cruz. Um, one restroom, how many people could that serve? In an A occupancy, it doesn't work. Right, she's now, not a good when, example. When you're, when, you're talk, when you're talking about something that was approved under a previous code, whatever that code was, and if they met it and they got their building permit, went through their inspections, passed everything, then it's, it can have its continued use. Anytime you change that use, increase occupant load, change the layout of the building, do alterations, remodels, it has to meet the current code. So I, I did look at one old set of plans, and, and it was one of the older, smaller restaurants, and there was uh, two restrooms, and it claimed right on the plan, one for the employees and one for the patrons. Almost 50 people in the restaurant as far as the seating capacity. That one restroom is, is not sufficient. So, okay, I shouldn't have even said let's keep the amount of restrooms theoretical because, like, Shanty Shack has two for his 600 square feet. But is there a way that that we could manage this by limiting occupancy so that they are within the the guidelines? And well, when you say occupancy, uh, you're talking occupant load. Yeah, occupant not load. Not the yeah, occupancy. Right. O that's, right. is it, occupant is it load. Assembly use, is it a right. business? Right, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so occupant right. load for both indoor, outdoor. Who's going to monitor it? Uh, that generally falls to the fire department, and they don't have time to run around all night long and make sure that people aren't, you know, uh, misusing their, their posted occupant loads. We, we have currently had have that as an issue, right? Certain businesses before. I, I'm sorry. I mean, we currently have that as a as a reality where we've approved things that, and we put the sign up, and we can't. Yes, we get have, but those that. businesses are quite a bit different. Okay. And, and we know they're not going to exceed those limitations, or there's portions of them, mm -hmm. like a particular bank where we limited the occupant load. We also looked at other factors, like um, well, it was going through plan review. They said, well. You know, you have to do this break room at 15 square feet per mm -hmm. person. Well, those are the same people that are running the bank. Mm -hmm. It can't be in both places at once. So, mm -hmm. you know, it took a little bit outside the box thinking. Mm -hmm. Restaurants, a little bit different setup, you know. And, and I understand they want to make money. I get that. I'm all for it. I'll help them as far as I can get them. But, you know, in a restaurant, you want to load that thing up as much as you can. You're in business to make money. And, and I can't blame them for that. But how, how do you put a limitation to it? Who's going to monitor that? I, I, yes, I, I agree. Theoretically, I mean, yes, and practically. Um, but I also know that some of these businesses have to limit themselves because they actually can't, they haven't designed a kitchen or a business that can serve that many seats. And so to maintain their level of service, they monitor themselves for that, you know, for that purpose so that they can maintain a level of service. I mean, so I'm, I'm just looking, I'm just grasping because I just know what the impact of this is going to be for them, you know, and to, to make these changes is going to be, some of them can't, period. Like, we know that. I've had conversations with them. And so I'm just desperately trying to figure out if it's even just eight months more of income before they have to close their doors. Like, I feel like we owe them. They brought huge amount of income to this community. They do make us a destination. And it's because of these business owners that we are who we are as a tourist community or a local establishment for those of us that go to La Posta or whatever. So I'm just... Just grasping. I just, I mean, it's not as easy as just for me as just saying, well, council wants us to do this, and so we should just move it forward because I just feel like if we can extend this six months so that they can make a new plan for themselves, like we should do that. So 
I don't like to waste time or yeah. do subcommittees or any of those things unless it's really critical and this feels critical to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add that the subcommittee, you know, we've extended the temporary to May 25th of next year. You know, we the idea with that was that we would have a year from approval, you know, to allow for more of that time. I think that that's a conversation the subcommittee could continue to have at council. I think that that temporary extension has been one that we've worked to, you know, have work with the businesses as they transition. So I would say that that's an, an area we can continue to discuss with them. So what if, like, as a... I hear you. As a way of like passing this through, what if we recommended to council to not take it up for a year? I love that. Like that kind of thing. Thank you. Just thank you, Mr. Gervasoni, by the way. I should have said thank you before I went on my tangent. Thank you. So, <laughs> does that help the businesses I, or does it leave this weird liability gap that's more dangerous? Like, I'm not convinced that not passing this helps them. Yeah. It's I, know, I know what you're saying, but. Yeah, I, Weird. I, I guess I'll just go to my comments really quick. I mean, I, I think that um, one of the things that really stuck out about the staff report is that what is being recommended here tonight is actually one of the, if not the most liberal um, program for this in the cities that were surveyed. And it, that the cities that I saw on that list are all the big ones, all the ones that are not only huge population centers, but also ones that are very, very much like Santa Cruz. And with that said, which is a great job by staff, by the way, this is like an ex excellent report. There's been a lot of work on this and um, I, we're still not there. I don't feel like I agree with uh, Pete here that, you know, I, I don't see another option here in terms of not moving forward on this, but I think we need to put a couple real bolded asterisks on this. Like, have we reached out to uh, State Assembly Member Pellerin? Have we reached out to John Laird? Um, maybe there's a way to keep beating the bushes on other cities, but I just, you know, for our needs and our city, businesses came through in a big way during COVID to be able to provide people with something to do, somewhere to go out to eat, somewhere to have a drink. And um, I do think that, you know, we owe them due diligence, but at the same time, as, as you said, we've extended this a number of times. And so I just don't see where else there is to go here, except uh, maybe to the next level and see if our state representatives might have something to say or if there's something that can be done. But um, that's where I'm at. I mean, I, I hear you. <laughs> I, I just, I don't, I don't see what delaying this is going to do, but I also don't see what pushing it forward is going to help. So we're in this really just kind of you know, terrible sandwich. Um, and there's four of us in the sandwich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seven. So anyways, those would be my comments. Commissioner Dan. Um, yeah, I actually, if we're getting close to the point of uh, wrapping up, I, I actually did have one question about the operational standards and something that I think should be specified a little bit more, and that's with regard to amplified music. There's a bullet that says amplified sound shall only be permitted outside of the building when set to a low volume for ambient background music. Is vo low volume defined somewhere? That seems pretty subjective. I forget where it's defined, but I really feel like it is. <laughs> well, I guess, I, I mean, I would just, if, when there's time to make a motion, I would just ask that that, if it's not defined, that it should be defined because it's, especially when there's no um, permit being issued, these standards need to be really tight. Um, and then again, when somebody's going through a remodel, um, there's an allowance for um, porta potties. And I assume that it's also required that there be hand washing stations but it should be specified that that must be the case, especially for restaurants. I'm sure they would anyway, but we should just write it in. Um, and I, I say I, I generally support the direction. Um, I feel for folks trying to make their outdoor seating work, but on the other hand, I also um, you know, see that the city has gone to great lengths to try to make this work within the confines of uh, the state codes, and um, so I, I am prepared to move it on, and we can add a direction to any motion that the council consider um, providing folks with more time 
under the current rules and the current um, context we're in with, um, and, and since we have about a year and a half, two years even. So I, I'd be fine with that. That sounded like a motion. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? I would just say I, I understand it can't get stuck here, and we can actually make change or make a difference if it does get to council. Yeah. It's not going to help the community if it gets stuck in planning commission as much as I want us to be the ones that solve this miracle solution, but um, it, we do need to move it forward. So I get it. I'm just, we need to keep working on it too. We can't do this and then not push council to, um, to, to help the community, the business community. And did you want to offer a friendly amendment on the timing? I think we could recommend the council. I thought you were doing it. I thought it was a great idea. So, yeah, just to get some clarity on that really quick. To see how long you want to make it. The city temporary ordinance is extended until 2025, correct? Yeah, May 31st of 2025. And then the state has given us until July 1st, 2026? The state has extended the alcohol permit, the temporary alcohol permits, until 2026. That's what it was. Okay. Commissioner. But it's not that simple. It's going to take some time once these are through for people to develop mm. projects and bring them in, right? Like in, so we like if it was the day before it kicked in, we'd be creating this yeah, weird probably. like yeah. yeah yeah. I mean, do we know that though? Do I'm, we I'm know down that no man's land? Do we know, know that like their cutoff date that they're like everybody has to be compliant? I mean, that would mean like working backwards and that their jurisdictions are working. That you know, once we these people submit, it's not even in their control anymore. So do we know what that gray area actually is? When they draw that off, are they like, and you have six, like, you need to be submitting within a certain amount of time? I'm guessing that's probably what it's going to be versus preemptively. Yeah, I, I don't have those specifics. I know I've been working with ABC on the parklet approvals, and they're, you know, anxious every time we approve a permanent one to just get it moving through the queue. Um, yeah, I, I would imagine. I mean, for us as well with the temporary expiration, you know, We've worked on, if you get your application in, you're me making meaningful work towards transitioning this. We're working with you. That's the goal with all of this, so. Okay, so we have a motion and a second further comment. Okay. Are we doing a, and are we recommending that the council? Yeah, I didn't really make a real motion, yeah. so we probably should do that. Yeah. Just oh. procedurally to be on the up and up. <laughs> I thought I heard those words. Um, so I'll move the staff recommendation um, with an added direction that we recommend to the council that they take a hard look at um, providing some additional time um, for the businesses. And also that the low volume um, is defined, if it isn't already, and specify that during remodels, uh, when temporary restrooms are used, that hand washing stations are also provided. Anything else? Motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. motion. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I'd like to uh, add a friendly amendment uh, just in terms of direction for the subcommittee. Um, who is that? Is Newsom, Brunner, and Colin Terry Johnson to uh, reach out to state representatives on this and see what, what could be done, what can be done. It's a pretty tight time frame. It's like, what, is there a legislative session? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, legislatively, I, I don't know. But you're sure reaching out is always a good idea. That's well, acceptable. Reaching out. <laughs> See what can be done. Okay. We good? Okay, let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Paul Hamas? Yes. And that passes unanimously, and that concludes the public hearing. Uh, on to information items. Thank you to everyone in the public that came out. Hello again, Vice Chair and Commission. Uh, brief director's report, uh, the downtown expansion update. Uh, just went to uh, 
the City Council and Planning Commission joint study session on Tuesday. Um, and just noting again for everyone in attendance here that there's a July 10th comment deadline. So for anyone who wishes to, uh, to comment on that, go online and find that and uh, reach out to our senior planner, Sarah Noisy. Um, as for council actions, uh, the project at the food bin site on Mission was approved by council since the last time we met at a planning commission that was on May 28th. Um, the Cruise Hotel is going back to council uh, this coming Tuesday uh, with some enhanced voluntary conditions uh, related to uh, uh, low cost visitor accommodations. Um, I don't have the specifics on that, but there, there's you know detailed question. calculations on uh, on what those low cost visitor accommodations would be uh, in those voluntary conditions and that information's in the staff report posted online. And then uh, we don't anticipate anything in the near future, but there there could be another uh, another planning project on a future planning commission agenda uh, soonish. But uh, they that's very very, mis <laughs> very mysterious. That, that's that's bad. <laughs> there, there's nothing currently on our our tentative agenda list okay. yeah. in the next couple months. That's a better way of saying okay. it. Okay. <laughs> we are in a climate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but I, I do just want to note that in by September, staff anticipates bringing an ADU ordinance uh, amendments to the Planning Commission, which would include things like meeting state legislation, our current code, uh, as well as changes to our owner occupancy. So be on the lookout for that. That's something exciting we're working on right now. Awesome. I have one quick question. You know, Tuesday night we're talking about that huge carrot that would make the developers stay under 12 stories. Mm -hmm. Use the Clock Terror project as like a, a hypothetical test fit of that. I know it's grandfathered in, but I just thought of the that thing we're working on with the expansion plan, how it might look on a different site like that. So just saying that to plant it in your head. But I love that idea of, you know, make developers want to go to 12 by giving them so much stuff that they're like, we love 12 stories. Yeah. So I just wanted to state that. It clicked in my yeah. head after the meeting Tuesday that maybe a similar approach might work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we do believe allowing for that offsite um, uh, affordable housing to meet those requirements is, is a powerful incentive. So yeah, it worked last time. Could, it could in the future be explored elsewhere if, if we receive that direction. All right, well, we probably shouldn't go too deep into that. Mm -hmm. I, sorry, I had one more announcement that reminded me. Um, we are having a second community meeting for the Clock Tower project because that meeting went very heavy on the applicant side and had very little time for public discussion. So um, the next meeting will be June 26th. Um, the city is going to lead it, city staff, and we're going to dedicate the time to um, getting public feedback. So that's it. Does this um, count as towards one of their five? I don't believe it does. The The state law says hearings, and um, mm. this is not a hearing. And then I think also this is, um, you know, more of an extension of that first meeting because the agenda was a little different than we expected. Yeah, I mean, I think we could all agree with that, but <laughs> um, I just am wondering since they're, you know, yeah, people like to be by the books. So. Right. Also, we're only in the pre-application phase, so um, they haven't even submitted a formal application yet. Right, but I, but it is my understanding that even that first meeting that we had, it, because they submitted for pre-app, that that is one of their five. Is that not? Um, that's not. I think we were being conservative and counting it, but I think if we look at the language in the state law, it does say hearings and. Um, okay. Yeah. We can confirm yeah. that with the, yeah. the city attorney's office, too. I'll confirm that, too, but I do believe that five-meeting clock starts at a find, the finding submission. of a, yeah, a complete project. Oh, okay. With the formal not cancel that second yeah. meeting, please. The formal application, <laughs> I think. <laughs> okay. Interesting. That's good to know. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, um, they, I'll reach the, out if, the I, if I hear otherwise. said otherwise, just FYI, so they that might want to be clarified because I, I specifically asked that question. Yeah. Okay. That, that concludes my report.
can awesome. I oh. remind? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. When is the, our next meeting? If you're going to get to that. None are currently. So, I heard but, September. But, yeah. But yeah, I guess yeah. I was. Well, yeah, I guess There's I just There's currently nothing to... on our, our uh, tentative agenda list until that September ADU project, but. Okay. And there are projects that come in and timelines that change, so and you'll let things us know could if be that's added. Yes, okay. definitely. Great. And I think our um, next meeting falls on Fourth of July, so that's not going to happen. Yes. For sure, yeah. <laughs> no one's coming in on the Fourth of July to have a planning. That's a good thing. I cleared my calendar personally. Say hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No more informational items. Awesome. No subcommittee or oral reports. No items referred to your future agenda. Okay, I will adjourn the meeting and uh, thank you for being here. Good awesome job. Chair. Thank you. Good job, Cherry. Like a pro. Yeah. Do not help like you've like done it before. before the